Good day, Your Excellency. Uh, my name is Fajan Nugraha. I'm the editor for International Desk for Matcom.id. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give you give in a short window of your time. Uh, I'm sure you are, you are very have a busy, busy schedule. So, uh, Madam, we are clear Thanks about uh, what happened between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, we would like to know, especially regarding the situation, the border between the two countries. Can you explain what happened between Russia and uh, Ukraine? Well, if you ask me what is happening on the border of Russia and Ukraine, I will give you a very short uh, answer. Nothing, <laughs> nothing is happening. <laughs> All this uh, hysteria, uh, invasion of uh, Russia on Ukraine are fakes, and uh, it is just a mean to divert attention from other uh, issues of uh, security in Europe and in, in, in the world. If you ask me whether uh, there are um, issues between Russia and Ukraine, I will tell you, first of all, uh, in Russia, we see Ukrainians as our brothers and sisters. You know, I was born in Kiev myself. I'm not Ukrainian, I'm Russian, but uh, it just highlights how close uh, Russians and Ukrainians are. Uh, my, my father is uh, from uh, Ukraine. He grew up uh, in Ukraine. Around 40% of Ukrainians uh, speak Russian as their native language. We have more than 3 million Ukrainians in Russia. We are very closely interrelated and for centuries Ukraine was a part of uh, uh, of Russia, then the Soviet Union. So uh, once again, we see Ukrainians as our brothers and sisters. What, why would we want to fight them? It's, it's, it's an absurd uh, uh, accusation. Uh, of course, there are issues uh, because uh, in 2014, there was a very absolutely illegitimate coup d'etat in Kiev. Uh, when the power was uh, came to uh, people who started to uh, oppress the population in Ukraine who wanted to speak Russian language and saw themselves as having Russian origins or being Russian. Uh, and uh, some of the regions of uh, Ukraine, which are predominantly uh, Russian, uh, opposed this uh, illegitimate uh, government. Mm. So there are two issues, basically, Crimea. Yeah. For Crimea, uh, we consider the issue closed. Mm. Crimea came back to Russia uh, after a referendum where more than 90% of the population of Crimea voted first to be independent from Ukraine, second to join Russia. Uh, if this is not democratic, then what is there were a lot of accusations that people were forced to vote. How can you force two million people uh, to vote in this or uh, that way? So uh, we consider it an absolutely democratic and legitimate process when uh, it was the will of people. Ninety by I, again, I'm saying that ninety percent of population of Crimea voted to come back to Russia. Uh, and we consider this the issue closed. Crimea will never go back to Ukraine. Uh, especially if you consider history, Crimea was always part of Russia. And uh, in 1956, when uh, our then leader Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine, it didn't matter because we were uh, part of the same country. Uh, the second issue is the issue of Donbass. Uh, with the predominantly Russian population who doesn't want to be oppressed mm -hmm. uh, by the government. They want to have the right to speak Russian language, mm -hmm. uh, to have their own culture and uh, traditions. Uh, but this is part of Ukraine. It's not a war between or an issue between Russia and Ukraine. It's uh, uh, a civil war going inside of Ukraine. Of course, we cannot uh, remain indifferent because these are people uh, that are speaking Russian, they're ethnic Russians. Uh, but the only way to solve this problem, this conflict, is to follow the Minsk agreements, which were um, 
signed in 2014 and 2015, which uh, sought to end war in, in this region of Ukraine. Mm. Uh, it, these agreements were written in 2014 by the trilateral contact group on Ukraine, consisting of Ukraine, Russia, and the uh, OSC, with mediating by the leaders of France and Germany mm -hmm. in the so-called Normandy format. So uh, these agreements basically uh, wrote, uh, uh, laid a, uh, um, a roadmap to end the war in uh, Donbas uh, and to give this uh, region a special autonomous status within Ukraine. And we were facilitating this uh, process. We are not part of the uh, Minsk agreements. Uh, we're being accused that we're not fulfilling the Minsk agreement, but you can accuse France or Germany of not fulfilling them. Actually, the part who is not fulfilling this agreement is Kiev. So uh, in, instead of uh, accusing uh, Russia or putting pressure on Russia or putting sanctions on Russia, our Western friends should uh, probably uh, put pressure on Kiev to fulfill the agreements they signed and uh, to install peace in their own region. So basically that's how we see uh, the uh, situation. So. Uh, but uh, international media accused that uh, Russia has already uh, 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 around 100,000 uh, uh, troops in, uh, uh, near the border. Can you comment on that? You are saying that uh, the West is accusing yeah. Russia of having troops inside our own territory? <laughs> This is the perfect uh, right of Russia to move our troops uh, wherever we need inside our own territory. Mm. Why is no one mentioning the fact that the NATO countries are bringing troops and armaments thousand kilometers away from their own country's borders? Again, we are having troops on our own territory. We, <laughs> not a single soldier crossed the border uh, of uh, Russia. And uh, while NATO soldiers and officers and NATO armaments are being moved to Ukraine, uh, and uh, no one is saying a word about that. Actually, Ukraine has also uh, a big um, group of uh, troops on the border of Russia, uh, and the border of uh, Donbas uh, region. No one is mentioning a, world, a word about it. So we have the perfect right to have our troops in our territory mm -hmm. as long as they're on our own territory. Don't you agree? Yes. This is said by, by uh, President Putin uh, when he said about NATO is deceiving Russia. Uh, uh, because NATO prom promised that will not push their infrastructure to the east. And, but eventually NATO has troops in Romania and Poland. And is, 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 is this what you mean about the NATO, uh, Ambassador? You're, you're absolutely right. We were deceived by uh, our Western partners. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, there was uh, a, a so-called gentleman agreement between Russia and uh, NATO that the NATO will not expand further to the uh, east uh, because of uh, Russia's uh, security concerns. Mm. Uh, they didn't uh, fulfill their uh, promises uh, and uh, NATO expanded. Uh, we uh, feel that this is Russia feels that this is a threat to our security. That was the reason why uh, recently Russia has put a request to NATO and the US uh, to uh, have uh, security guarantees uh, for Russia. We even drafted an agreement on security guarantees for Russia. And I, I would like to uh, highlight that it's not we, it's not Russia who is moving uh, missiles or arms to the border of Canada or to Mexico. This is NATO that is bringing 
uh, arms, missiles, uh, and troops to our borders, how can we not uh, feel threatened by it? So yeah. our uh, motivation was to have guarantees from uh, the United States and NATO that our security will be ensured. ensured. Uh, and actually, that is consistent with all the international agreements that were signed by uh, Russia and European countries, especially um, in the framework of the OSCE, the Istanbul Declaration, the Astana Declaration, that uh, the security of one country should never be ensured at the detriment of the security of other country. That That's what we call the uh, a concept of indivisible security. That means every country, be it big or small, has the right uh, for their security to be protected, their interests be respected. That's what uh, that's what uh, our position is. Mm. So uh, imagine that Ukraine or say Georgia uh, become part of NATO that the military, I, I would ne not use the word defense in this, in this context, the military uh, infrastructure of NATO will come to the borders of Russia. Mm. The missiles will reach Moscow in just two or three minutes. Right. How can we look, how can we be indifferent uh, to this kind of uh, situations. So that's why we try to engage our Western partners in a dialogue for our security, in order for our security to be uh, uh, protected. Once again, we are not moving our missiles <laughs> to the border of the US. It's NATO that are bringing their uh, military infrastructure to our borders. As you see this uh, situation, what uh, Russia want from NATO uh, about the crisis with the Ukraine uh, today? It's not about it's it's not about Ukraine. Basically, you know, uh, uh, with Ukraine, we want uh, a simple thing: don't interfere, yeah. uh, don't instigate, don't don't uh, have all this hysteria around uh, and fakes around this. Uh, invasion of <laughs> Russia, Ukraine. Uh, from NATO, we want hmm. uh, security guarantees. We want, we ha we've we already uh, had some rounds of uh, dialogue and consultations with both with the United States and NATO. We're not satisfied with the uh, answers uh, they've given to our requests, uh, but we are ready to continue the dialogue so that we can find the solutions. But instead of uh, trying to see our point of view, uh, to compromise, uh, to uh, ensure uh, securities for all countries uh, involved, our Western friends are just creating this noise and all this uh, situation around Ukraine. It's, it's, it's a much, a uh, larger situation than, than uh, and Ukraine is just being, uh, unfortunately for, for Ukrainians, uh, they're being just an instrument uh, used to uh, attack our country. So, so uh, we've seen a lot of accusation for, uh, to Russia about threatening to provoke the World War III uh, regarding Ukraine situation. Do you think that this, that this accusation filled with a hidden agenda? Uh, yes, of course. That's what I've been trying to tell you. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course, it's a, it's a, it's a hidden agenda. It's a, as I told, it's a, a it's an effort to shift the attention of the world community from um, the global situation, uh, basically uh, the situation that affects uh, the whole world, to just the situation between Russia uh, and Ukraine. And of course, this, these are fakes. There is no evidence. You know, all the uh, Western uh, mainstream media are showing mm. photos of Russian troops on Russian territory and saying that's a sign of uh, aggression. <laughs> it's it's absolutely absurd. So um, 
yes, we've been uh, having military exercises within our territory, also with Belarus by a mutual agreement within the territories of both countries. Uh, but that's the perfect right that we have. We're not threatening anyone. Uh, but, uh, but it seems that uh, we have two polar uh, political uh, uh, force, yeah. Russia with China and Western. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, the, 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 the two sides always uh, have their own beliefs about uh, the geopolitical uh, stance today. Well, <laughs> you know, yeah, that, that could be, uh, it's, it, what you asked is a very comprehensive uh, question, you know, you can talk for hours about that, but mm -hmm. uh, let me say how, how we view the current political mm. situation, mm. geopolitical situation, which we share with China, basically. Mm. First of all, uh, the world is changing from a uh, unilateral, from uh, uh, just the world where we have just one center of power, one center of dominance, and uh, that is the US and uh, its allies. Uh, the world is changing to becoming a multipolar one where we see a center of power emerging in different parts of the world. And of course, it's China. Of course, it's ASEAN, including Indonesia. Of course, it's Russia. Uh, in Latin America, the BRICS countries, uh, and, and that's what our Western uh, partners uh, cannot accept. So these people have been dominating the world for centuries, and uh, they are actually used to uh, ensuring the prosperity of their countries by exploiting all the other, all, all the world. In, you, in, in Indonesia, you, you should know it much better than we do <laughs> because you you you've experienced this uh, colonial uh, times um, they don't want uh, the world uh, to be changed they want to uh, ensure the status quo by force and that's by threats of force mm -hmm. uh, and that's what they're trying to do uh, with china and china as you know is a strategic partner of um, russia uh, we share this view on the global uh, okay. situation. And if you followed uh, our uh, president visited Beijing uh, on the 4th of February, he attended also the opening of the Olympics, um, of the Olympic Games, and he had a very substantial meeting with uh, President Xi Jinping. And there was a joint declaration issued uh, as the result of this meeting where China supports our position on uh, security uh, guarantees. So uh, our uh, partnership with China is not a military alliance. It's not a political union. Uh, it's a partnership that is based uh, on a similarity of uh, views that we have um, on what is happening in the world and the ways to uh, actually uh, improve the situation to ensure peace and stability, both uh, in the Asia Pacific and uh, in the world as a whole. We have the same view, for instance, on this notion of the uh, rules based order uh, that has been promoted by, by the West. Uh, we are very much against, of, uh, against this notion, and I will explain why. Uh, after World War II, uh, the world order was based on international law and the UN Charter. What is wrong with that? We think that uh, the UN, uh, the UN Charter and the international law are the norms and rules that allow us uh, to uh, ensure peace and stability in, in the world. Now our Western partners are trying to change that by introducing this notion of uh, uh, rules-based order. The question is, who will be writing these rules? Yeah. Will it be Russia? Will it be China? Will it be Indonesia? I doubt it. Are strongly committed to 
UN Charter and the norms and rules of international law. Uh, but there's a lot of push that the UN should be uh, reform, reform, uh, Your Excellency. Uh, do you think that UN is, is should be reformed uh, regarding the situation, uh, the, the, the geopolitical situation today? Well, uh, so far UN has been quite instrumental in um, dealing with all the global uh, issues. Of course, the world has changed and uh, probably um, the, the, and, and, and it's, it's our position that uh, we, sh we should look at maybe probably enlarging the Security Council, yeah. but, uh, but only if all the countries do agree with that. Only if uh, it's a consensus among uh, uh, the, the countries, the UN uh, countries. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, quite a sensitive and uh, a slow process. Um, in my my own view, at the end of the day, of course, there will be some uh, uh, maybe some some reform of of uh, the UN. But uh, we haven't uh, yet produced any better. Uh, mechanism uh, or platform uh, to uh, deal with the global issues because it's an inclusive uh, mechanism where all countries are represented. While now the Western world is trying to create this exclusive clubs like the Quad or the AUKUS creating new divisive lines. Do we need these new divisive lines really? Do they, will, do they uh, help? to uh, make our world a more stable and peaceful place? Mm. The answer is definitely no. Mm. So uh, that's why we uh, really are, uh, as I said, committed to the UN Charter, to the norms and rules on international law. And we are against all these new divisive lines, all these new mm. uh, exclusive uh, organizations and um, uh, clubs. Uh, that our are that we see emerging like mushrooms uh, the initiative of our uh, western partners uh, okay your excellency, your excellency uh, but uh, we, we go back to the russian ukraine crisis uh, uh, your, uh, france and britain uh, they even uh, the foreign ministry of uh, uk uh, met with Prime Minister Lavrov, and uh, is there any window of opportunity peace around this crisis? But absolutely, that's what we are uh, <laughs> saying. That the crisis should be resolved, uh, and you know, uh, mm. when we talk, when we speak about crisis, we're uh, speaking about different things. <laughs> I'm afraid because uh, we have no intention to invade Ukraine. We don't want war. You know, we we uh, learned our, our lessons uh, in World War II. As you know, Russia has lost 27 million lives. We don't want that to happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking basically about the Minsk agreements and how uh, Kiev should uh, fulfill the agreements that they've committed to, uh, that they signed, the Ukrainian side signed. Uh, that's what we're saying. There is uh, no crisis on Russian-Ukrainian <laughs> border as such. So, uh, but the only way to... Uh, to have solution uh, for the Donbas region is to uh, implement the Minsk agreements, and of course there is uh, uh, there. Well, actually, there is no military solution. Basically, that's what, what we're saying. They, they, the only solution is uh, uh, to implement the Minsk agreement and to continue with the dialogue and uh, consultations. But the sanction threat from the Western countries, uh, uh, do you see that the sanction could be uh, uh, fair uh, in, in Russia's eyes? Fair? <laughs> Sanctions fair. can be fair. <laughs> <laughs> the only, in, the only uh, body in the world that has a legitimate right to uh, mm. install sanction is the security UN Security Council. All the uh, 
unilateral uh, sanctions are uh, illegitimate. Mm. As for the effect of the uh, sanctions, uh, they, they have no result. If you look at the uh, history, uh, okay, uh, Iran is under sanctions. Uh, have they uh, changed their policies? No. Uh, Cuba is under American sanctions. Yeah. Cuba is, is, is prospering and uh, uh, developing. Uh, we, uh, Russia is under sanctions uh, uh, from 2014. Uh, so we are not afraid of uh, sanctions. They will not lead to, to uh, anything, to any change of policies. Of course, of course there is not fair. They're not fair. Um, in a sense, it's an instrument of political pressure, but also it's an instrument of uh, unfair competition. For instance, when uh, the United States are threatening of imposing sanctions to countries that would like to buy Russia's defense equipment, mm. of course, it's uh, unfair competition because uh, uh, they are trying to sell their own equipment uh, instead. Okay, uh, we move to relation between Indonesia and Russia. Uh, you said earlier about the Quad, or maybe maybe I can say elitist among uh, giant politics in, in the world. Uh, but how Russia sees about Indo Indonesia in the Pacific push uh, towards the region? Uh, well, Indo Pacific, we also do not agree with this term. We are aware of the con in the Pacific concept um, produced by Indonesia and uh, that became the basis for the in the Pacific outlook for ASEAN and uh, we support it because it's uh, inclusive uh, in its nature. It, uh, it's um, uh, promotes uh, principles of uh, transparency, cooperation, inclusivity. But unfortunately, there are other concepts with the same name yes. <laughs> that are anything but that. They are not inclusive. And we know that they are uh, oriented against mm -hmm. China yeah. and Russia. Uh, as for Indonesia, uh, in Russia, we see Indonesia as the, our key partner and uh, our traditional friend among ASEAN countries. Indonesia is a very important uh, partner for us. We're strategic partners of ASEAN and Indonesia's leading country in ASEAN. Indonesia is one of the leading countries in the Muslim world. And Indonesia is a very active player in different uh, uh, international uh, structures, organizations, and forests, uh, including the UN. Uh, we've enjoyed very good cooperation with Indonesia when uh, your country was a non-permanent member of the Security Council. Uh, we supported several initiatives by Indonesia. We support Indonesian candidatures in different organizations. So Indonesia is very important to us. We look at, devel at developing more uh, cooperation between our two countries. Uh, our trade is growing. Um, last year, we've seen 40, despite the COVID, we've seen 40% of growth of our uh, bilateral trade. It's a very positive trend, and we really hope that it will continue in the future. I'm just wondering about the uh, Indonesia and uh, Russia relationship today, because uh, we all know that Russia already offered the Sukhoi SU-35. And then uh, I heard the last week uh, our government agreed to purchase fighter jet from our friends. And then uh, what happens with Sukhoi? Well, probably you should better <laughs> ask this question, your Ministry of Defense. But uh, seriously uh, speaking, uh, you know, we signed the contract on Sukhoi 35 in 2018. Um, there had been um, not big progress uh, in implementing this uh, uh, contract, but uh, hopefully uh, we will go on with it because uh, there was no official uh, information about any refusal from the government of Indonesia to go on with this contract.
that's all what I can say at this moment. But but is there any obstacle for the deals? Or uh, not from not from our side. Okay. We're ready. <laughs> okay. And the other thing I want to ask about a uh, vaccine, uh, our uh, badan pom badan pom uh, already give emergency use authorization. Is there any shipment for Sputnik vaccine in near time to Indonesia? Well, I know that there have been contacts between our respective agencies to use Sputnik V in uh, Indonesia. Yes, hopefully if you need it, uh, our vaccine were ready uh, to supply uh, it. Uh, uh, Sputnik V has been registered in more than 70 countries in the world. Uh, it produced uh, Sputnik V um, in cooperation with uh, some of the foreign countries, also in uh, uh, the Emirates, the South Korea, India. So uh, we are ready to cooperate with uh, Indonesia. We are ready to um, localize the product production of the vaccine uh, and or, or to supply the vaccine to Indonesia. Okay. Uh, but uh, how the R Russia and Indonesia relationship in the middle of pandemic? Is there any uh, like a significant improve? Uh, well, I think that our relations, despite the COVID, have been uh, developing in a very positive way. As I mentioned, uh, we've seen a 40% of uh, our growth of our uh, bilateral uh, trade. We are going on with some investment projects uh, in, in oil and gas uh, area. Also, there is a success story uh, of uh, one of our Russian IT companies uh, in Indonesia. Maybe you've noticed uh, Taxi Maxim, the online taxi services, actually they're provided by a Russian company. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> and more in, in more than 60 cities of uh, Indonesia, you can find uh, Taxi Maxim. Um, we've had good political contacts. Uh, last year, our uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Sergei Lavrov, visited Indonesia in, Ju in July. Uh, in December last year, we had the visit of a uh, security, oh, sorry, Secretary of Security Council of uh, Russian Federation, General Patrushev, uh, who had very um, substantial consultations on security issues with uh, Bapa Mahfud, who is the coordinating minister. Uh, so uh, hopefully uh, we are supporting uh, uh, Indonesia as uh, the um, chair of uh, the G20. Uh, and uh, hopefully if the COVID situation allows, we will um, have uh, the visit of President, uh, President Vladimir Putin to Indonesia, who will uh, take part in, in the G20 summit. Uh, but of course, uh, many things will depend on the COVID situation, both in Indonesia and Russia. Uh, about the G20, what are uh, Russia hoping from Indonesia pres presidency, Ambassador? Well, actually, uh, we think uh, that uh, Indonesia is uh, representing in, in uh, G20 uh, the uh, views and opinions uh, and the interests of uh, uh, both ASEAN countries, developing countries, countries of the Muslim world. So it's uh, it's, it's uh, we we support your priorities uh, during the G20 uh, presidency. So uh, we really hope that uh, your presidency will be uh, Indonesia's presidency will be a very uh, fruitful one uh, to establish more bridges between the countries to. Uh, find a comprehensive solution to the global uh, issues that all uh, countries are, are facing. Uh, so we are uh, looking to uh, cooperating with Indonesia in the framework of G20. Uh, there was already some meetings um, in this uh, 
framework, for instance, in December, there was a meeting of uh, G20 Sherpas and our uh, Sherpa, it's a lady, Svetlana Lukas, uh, attended uh, it. So, uh, and we're looking to attend most of the um, G20 meetings organized by Indonesia, either in person or online. Also, a lot of will depend on the COVID situation. Okay, uh, and the last for me, uh, what is your hope uh, for the relationship between Indonesia and Russia in the future? Well, I, uh, well, it's not a hope, it's, uh, I, I'm sure <laughs> that uh, the relations between Russia and Indonesia, uh, the future of these relations will, will be bright uh, because uh, also, we, we share uh, our views on what is happening in the world uh, and how we can solve these problems are very close. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will, uh, our cooperation will be uh, um, even better. And uh, we, if uh, our president uh, comes to Indonesia, we will become strategic partner by signing a declaration of strategic partnership between our two countries. Okay, that's all from me. Back to Mas Fajar. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for your time, uh, Madam uh, Ambassador. And thank you so that, much. Uh, yeah, yeah. We hope that you, you stay healthy and uh, looking you forward too. to see you too <laughs> in, in, in a private meeting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. You too. Stay, stay healthy and safe. Metcom.id, a part of Media Group Network.